वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु so we are studying the second chapter of the bhagavad gita um towards the end the discussion is arjuna has asked a question about the enlightened person what is it like to be enlightened and that's where the discussion is one of the reasons why this this section is important is that what is discussed here these are also the practices which we can do and we are supposed to do the word enlightened is not used the word used is sthita pragya in sanskrit which means stabilized wisdom it's a very precise use of the term as we study vedanta we begin to get it we begin to understand what it what they are saying it's not very difficult really you stay with it for some time you get it but then the next question comes that it's it fluctuates um it seems to come and go and it doesn't seem to be of it's difficult to make it practical in day to day life so this these two issues that it seems to come and go and it's difficult to make it practical in day to day life uh is uh, um an issue so how to stabilize this the practices are discussed here now w- one of the things one one has to do is that one has to stay with this teaching shravana manana nididhyasana shravana means to study vedanta systematically over a long period of time literally it means to hear manana means to reflect upon it after studying and reflecting one gets a kind of clarity one gets a kind of conviction also but it's yet it might not feel like a living truth so to make it a living truth one has to stay with this knowledge in meditation when you're sitting with your eyes closed but with your eyes open when you're interacting with the world still have to stay with this knowledge what is this knowledge i am brahman that that absolute existence consciousness bliss all this is also that same brahman and so one interacts from that point of view um to stay with this knowledge is called nididhyasana vedantic meditation vedantic meditation Me- vedantic meditation when you try to stay with the knowledge you will find a difficulty and the difficulty comes from two sources one is the sensory system our senses five senses seeing hearing smelling tasting touching and more subtle more inward to the sensory system is the mind so the fluctuations the wanderings of the mind and the pull the pull of the senses these two are powerful distractors from stabilizing wisdom that's why now sri krishna is giving a great emphasis on control of the senses indriya nigraha in order to stabilize vedantic wisdom control of the senses is very important and control of the mind so this is the discussion this is what is going on now we had done verse number 58 last time where he had emphasized the importance of control of the senses do you remember that nice example he gave of the tortoise which when threatened pulls in its head and the four limbs into the shell similarly we must have the capacity to detach ourselves from the uh, from engagement with the senses with the sense objects by the way when i'm saying senses and sense objects it simply means the um, our sensory system and their respective objects forms for the eyes sound for the ears and smell for the nose and so on taste for the for the tongue and so on now 59 please repeat after me vishaya vinivartante 
विषया विवर्तंते निराहार से देहिना निराहार से देहिना रसवज्जम रसोप्यस्य रसवज्जम रसोप्यस्य परम दृष्ट्वा निवर्तते परम दृष्ट्वा निवर्तते सो फिफ्टी नाइन्थ वर्स मीन्स द सेंस ऑब्जेक्ट्स फॉल अवे फ्रॉम समबडी हु इज कंट्रोलिंग द सेंसेस वील सी वॉट इट मीन्स बट द टेस्ट फॉर दोज ऑब्जेक्ट्स रिमेन्स इन द सबकॉन्शियस माइंड इवन द टेस्ट गोज अवे इवन दैट द डीप कंडीशनिंग इज ऑल्सो रिमूव वेन वन रियलाइज द अल्टीमेट ट्रूथ परम दृष्ट रियलाइज द अल्टीमेट रियालिटी सो वॉट डज दिस मीन control of the senses krishna is saying that the persons who can control the senses um who are not engaged continue or or, or obsessed with sense pleasures for such a person that vedantic wisdom becomes stabilized but one may ask a question even a sick person for example if you're very sick if you've got a fever or a cold or or you don't feel too good and you don't really want to go out to um, partying or you don't want you just want to stay stay in bed you know you don't even want to come to vedanta class so so a sick person also may not be interested in sense pleasures but does that mean a sick person's vedantic wisdom is stabilized no so what is this stabilization of wisdom and there he talks about it that the sense objects fall away from a person vishaya vinivartante what do you mean sense away uh, objects fall away that the person does no, no longer interacts with the sense object does not indulge in sense object enjoyment who a person who is disciplined who is controlling the senses so you're dieting so obviously you're not gorging yourself on 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 all sorts of uh, uh, delicacies but he says the desire for that the desire for those objects still remains deep in the mind so there's always a pull i am dieting so i don't want i don't i'm not going to eat that and inside the mind that's very nice i wish i could eat it so there's a pull i want it and i don't want it you really don't want it because you're dieting and you really want it because it you know it's going to be it's going to be very nice if you if you can eat that so there's a pull that pull that will continue for the time being that this is what sri krishna says in the beginning it will be there even when you have attended lots of vedanta classes and you've got lots of notes and you have memorized lots of verses even you're beginning to get vedanta still that pull will be there mm. until one realizes that ultimate reality that all this is nothing other than brahman and my inner reality is brahman R- rasa means raga abhilasha the the inner desire the pull towards sense pleasures i like to see that i like to hear that I like to taste that especially the tongue and tasting touching um param niraharasya dehina i ahara here does not just mean eating ahara in the word ahara in sanskrit usually is used in the sense of eating food but ahara literally means aryante it means whatever is pulled in so whatever is pulled in is not just food into the mouth but also forms what we see through the eyes sound through the ears uh, taste of course smell and touch so all the five sense objects are, are ahara are like food to the five sense organs and a person who controls that regulates that for that person you know might not be uh, overtly enjoying or uh, or involved in, in sense pleasures but still the trace is left behind i've told you this earlier i had an interesting experience many many years ago about 22 years ago when i was very sick in the hospital and uh, uh, i hadn't eaten for 2 weeks i was on on the iv the intravenous drip so i was sick now i hadn't eaten and if you if you gave me food i would i would throw uh, throw up i mean i couldn't bear the sight of food um and yet at night i would dream of food 
and it was very interesting the uh, food which i had the dishes which i had eaten which 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 were my favorites when i was a kid i i totally for, i thought i had forgotten about them I, i hadn't thought about them for ages and those floated up see what a deep impression raso varjam the traces are left behind we may not be aware of it but it is left behind we may not think we have those desires i don't have those desires you don't know it it's there and when see the body is deprived we are i'm not eating and i don't want to eat the body doesn't require that food because the body can't take that food if you literally bought those dishes here you're dreaming about it eat it couldn't or just throw up notice the the place for enjoyment is not really the body it's the mind which wants those things it's the mind which has been conditioned to enjoy those things it's the, the sense organs supply those tastes to the mind the taste has really nothing to do with nutrition the body needs nutrition a taste is an indicator which is uh, good for you which is bad for you. sometimes taste is a good indicator sometimes a bad indicator but taste is basically for the mind not for the not really for the body the body derives its nutrition from from the food and that's it but the mind derives enjoyment from from the sense inputs so that was very very educational to me that how the traces are left behind but even the traces go away when one realizes that it is brahman how does how do the traces go away it's like this i remember i saw one 3d movie one there was the first time it came to india many many years ago we were little kids and you had to go into the film theater and wear glasses so you could see things in three dimensions and i remember there were uh, there it was a, something to do with the, a, a mythological story somebody shooting arrows and the kids had we had great fun like you know we dodged the arrows because it's all coming out of the screen towards us and then somebody had a plate i still remember that a plate full of full of indian sweets laddus and it floated just in front of your holding it on the screen but it was floating in front of your nose like that right here and the kids had great fun swiping at it you know at the cinema hall you could see kids trying to grab it and they are laughing but none of them took it seriously they didn't feel deprived that i can't get hold of the sweets and didn't burst into tears no because they knew it's not there they knew it's not there when it's not there it's easy to give up it just looks like that as a sadhu told me once in himalayas ye bas dikhta hai mahatma ji hai kuch nahi it just looks like that swami but it is not what, what looks like that the he meant this entire world there is you say but of course in the world there is taste and sound yes there is taste and sound and smell but there is nothing here which will satisfy you there is nothing here that will complete you there is nothing here which will give you lasting peace the more you enjoy the sense inputs the more the thirst increases the more the desperation increases i had also seen so i'm think remembering lots of movies now but <laughs> in those days this vcr had come you know tapes so i had seen a hollywood movie i don't i forget the name of the movie but it was about a ghost and this ghost used to in those days smoking cigarettes was normal i mean people used to smoke uh, openly so this g- guy before dying he used to smoke a lot of cigarettes and he died and then um, it, i still remember that one scene he's become a ghost Of course it's a Hollywood movie so you can see him faintly in, in on the movie like a like a glowing figure. Now he's standing on a railway station or somewhere like that a platform and in those days it seems that I haven't seen it in here in America now. They used to dispense cigarettes from these like now you can get from you can get uh, potato chips and coke and all of that from a dispenser yes. and put in money and you can get a cigarette. So This ghost is standing and trying to put his hand hand into the machine to bring out the cigarette packet packets. But of course, alas, he can go pass through walls, but he can't catch anything. So he can't really catch the cigarette packet, and nor can he can he smoke it. And I felt this is why we are reborn. These tremendous obsessions we have with enjoying material things. Once this body falls apart and we can no longer enjoy these material things, we want it so much. that's why by god's grace i would say we are given more f- a new physical body to start the game all over again anyway that was just a thought 
So rasovadyam, the taste for that remains. And it's a terrible thing. I, I, I remember feeling at that time, or later when I reflected upon it, it's a terrible thing to have a strong, obsessive desire and no way of fulfilling it. So that's why I guess we are reborn again and again, so that we have a way of experiencing, uh, fulfilling those desires. But fulfilling is a wrong word. We just experience it again and again, and there's no fulfillment. And then we move on. So, raso vajyam, raso pyasya param drishtva nivartate. The traces are left behind, but even the traces are burnt up when you realize the ultimate truth that Brahman alone is real and I am Brahman. The world is an appearance like a movie. You, I will not repeat it, but you remember I've told you the story of the princess of Kashi. So the moment the prince realized that the princess in the picture was none other than, than he himself. When he was a kid, he had been painted in that way. So um, he realized there is no princess of Kashi apart from him. So what he desired is a, is a delusion, is an illusion that, is, that that person is not there, does not exist apart from him. Always was him. So the desire goes away. Like that, realizing the ultimate, all these desires, even the trace of it goes away. Then, number 60. Yatoto hya pikonteya Yatato hya pikonteya Purushasya vipaschita Purushasya vipaschita Indriyani pramathini Indriyani pramathini Haranti prasabhambana Haranti prasabhambana O Arjuna, these powerful senses the senses mean the sense organs, forcibly lead astray the mind of even the struggling white per wise person, the wise person who is a spiritual seeker and practicing spiritual disciplines, you know, meditating, praying and controlling the senses, still swept away by the powerful senses. Now one might think, oh, if the wise person is swept away by these uh, senses, then what's the point? Uh -huh. So, in the introduction to this verse, the commentator in this particular book, Sridhar Swami says, Indriya Sanyamanam Vinatu Sthita Pragyata Nasambhavati Without control of the senses, stabilization of Vedantic wisdom is not possible. Therefore, Ataha, therefore, Sadhaka Vasthayam Tatra Mahan Prayatna Kartabhya Therefore, when you are a seeker, Sadhaka means a spiritual practitioner, at that stage, a great effort is to be put in to control the senses. So it's not meant to be negative, not meant to be pessimistic. You can try, but it's, you're going to fail. No, not in that sense. It's just a cautionary thing that it's very powerful. So one must be careful, one must be ready to fail and try again, and keep trying, and it's necessary to keep trying, to bring the senses under our control. Uh, there is a... Um, R nice saying which says that alas I have been made the servant by the servants of my servants aha kinkarasya kinkarehi kinkarikritaha alas kinkara means a servant uh, so by the servant of my servants my servant is the mind and the mind's servants are the <coughs> senses but I the Atman the self I have become a servant to my senses. My eyes want to see this and I run around trying to get it. My uh, tongue wants to taste it, I run to the uh, restaurant to eat it. Uh, and so on. Sight, sense, sound, uh, touch, uh, all of these things, I st keep running around to procure these things from the world for, for my senses. I think that... Uh, you know, yeah, it's my senses and my mind. I can control it. Let my mind think about these things, but what my mind, what's there in my mind, I can control it. We think so, but it's not at that easy. We shall see in the next verse itself. But I'll tell you a little story. Um, 
Swami Nishreya Shanandaji was the uh, founder of our movement in South Africa many, many years ago. He was a disciple of Swami Shivananda. That means a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, his disciple. So he was, a, from all accounts, I've never seen him, but from all accounts, he was an extraordinary teacher, extraordinary master, and a yogi himself. So he talks about this idea that it's my mind and I can control my mind. What's so great about it? He says, imagine you have um, an apartment in some city and your friend says to you that can I, I'm going to that city, can I stay in your apartment for a couple of days? And you say, sure, it's my apartment. I'm going to give you a note for the caretaker and he'll just give you the keys. You can, you can go in there and stay there. So your friend turns up at your apartment in that city and rings the bell and um, a couple of hefty guys come out, suspicious looking characters and say, yeah, what do you want? And um, you say that your friend says, I'm going to stay here. Says who? Well, my friend owns this apartment. Look. Here it says that it is, uh, l let him stay here for a few days. And these two guys, they pick up your friend and toss him out on the street. Now, can you say that it's still your apartment? Notionally, nominally it's your apartment, but it's no longer under your control. There are squatters there. There are people who have taken it over. It's no longer your apartment. Our mind is like that. We have entertained sights and sounds and smells and touches uh, for so long and thought patterns and habitual ways of thinking um, prejudices so long that now when I think all right I'm going to think I am the Atman that's your friend let this thought stay in the mind I am the Atman and all these hefty guys that's the sights and sounds and smells they pick up this poor I am the Atman thought and throw it out on the street <laughs> my guru has told me to repeat the mantra here is the poor little mantra, look, and it goes to the mind, can I stay in the mind for some time? And these other thoughts who have been staying there for years and years together, they are big and nourished, you know, they have been, they are strong. And they pick up the poor little mantra and throw it out on the street. So it's no longer under your control. That's why this uh, control of the senses. Another, a subtle question, sometimes these questions don't occur to us until we start practicing. A subtle question is this, what is more important, control of the senses or control of the thought? I'm, I might argue, yes, let me enjoy things of the world, mentally I am unaffected. If that's, so, isn't that all right? If only you could do that. <laughs> it's not that easy, it's not that easy. It is true. The mind is more important than the senses. If one could remain mentally com uh, completely unaffected uh, while gliding through the world, if you could do that, and yogis, there are yogis who can do that, but not at the beginning. At the beginning, the trick is always to start with the, with the physical, with the gross, with the obvious, and then work your way inwards to the subtle ones. Another question is this. Right now here the, the commentator said, Indriya Sangyamam Vina Tu Stita Pragyata Na Sambhavati Without control of the senses, stabilization of Vedantic knowledge is not possible. Ramanu Jacharya, who was the great teacher of Vishishtadvaita and teacher of Bhakti, he takes up this point and he says, Notice what these two verses, if you put them together, you come up with an interesting conundrum. It says, until you realize the ultimate, the traces, the desires will remain in your mind. The traces will remain. You can control it, but the traces will remain in the mind. And now you are saying, without control of the senses, you cannot re uh, realize the ultimate. Without realizing the ultimate, desires will remain and senses will be turbulent. Without controlling the senses, you cannot realize the ultimate. Isn't it a vicious circle? How do you get out of it? And there Ramanuja introduces bhakti. He introduces devotion, love. Love is very attractive. So when my beloved Krishna or Rama or Christ or whatever, these figures who are, who are in universally attractive, that is put before you. The beautiful stories of Krishna, 
the beautiful modes of worship, flowers and light and music, and yes, delicious food, all offered to, to the Lord and taken as prasad. So all of that, when, when you use those to attract the mind, bhakti makes it easy. The senses attract the mind. Bhakti attracts the mind. You see why or a great teacher once told me, told us that why bhakti is important for people who are on the path of jnana, on the path of knowledge, Vedantic knowledge, self-realization, why bhakti is important. Because otherwise what, often what happens is that knowledge, when we study this, it removes ignorance. The very nature of knowledge is to remove ignorance. But if the mind is not sufficiently purified, what will happen is, it will be a kind of intellectual removal of ignorance. I did not know, now I know. But what I want still remains the same. Because of past conditioning. What I want does not come from the intellect. It comes from past conditioning. It comes from the senses. What my senses like. It's not an intellectual decision that I like a cookie. <laughs> it's a sensual decision. So, at the level of senses, in the, word, the terms used in, um, in Hindi are very nice. It says, um, desire, kama, desire, is at the level of prana. Wo pran ki baat, baat hai. Buddhi ki baat nahi hai. That means it's not something in the intellect. What am I? What is the nature of this world? What am I? That the intellect knows or does not know. But what I want, it's not really, it doesn't have much to do with the intellect. So it could be possible, not only po could be possible, it often is the case that we understand a lot of things through Vedanta, but the heart still wants what it was conditioned to want. Now, this Vedantic teaching does not work at the level of the heart. It works at the level of the intellect. That's why so many stringent conditions are there for a purified mind. Purified mind means a purified heart. But Bhakti works at the level of, of, of the heart. Bhakti is, is nothing other than transformed desire. The, the nature of desire is, I want the world. The nature of bhakti is, I want God. Notice that the I want is still the same. I want. Not a question of what I know and what I do not know. I want the world that's replaced with God. So bhakti is very useful in the path of jnana. When your mind your heart is given to God in, in any particular form, whichever is your tradition, could be Krishna or Christ, whichever is your tradition, whichever is your approach. So a devotional approach is very useful for a jnani because it purifies the heart and allows knowledge to have full play. Then you can actually live the knowledge and the knowledge will become stabilized. Sthita pragya. All right. Yatato hiya pikonteya. O Arjuna, even if trying. So this person is actually trying. It's not just theoretical. The person is meditating. The person is doing all sorts of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Vedantic study and trying to control the senses. Vipaschita. Vipaschita means a wise person. Um, wise person here is said, viveki no api. A person who has viveka. Brahman is real. Who, who has feels that. The world is evanescent, temporary, transient, passing. I should try to realize God in this very life. Who feels that? Even such a person is swept away by the powerful senses. Vivekina. Attended lots of Vedanta classes. Still, when anger comes, greed comes, can't control. Why? Because of the senses. Mana Indriyani. The mind and the senses, both, they, they sweep this person away. But the point is, Mahan Yatna Kattabhya, one should make a big effort, one should make a serious, dedicated effort over a long period of try, time to get mastery over the sensory system. If you do not, okay, uh, 61, and then we will see what happens if we do not. 61, he sums up this whole approach of controlling the senses. 61. Tani sarvani sangyamya. Tani sarvani sangyamya. Yukta asita matpara. 
ಯುಕ್ತ ಆಸೀತ ಮತ್ಪರ ವಶೇಹಿ ಯಸ್ಯಂದ್ರಿಯಾಣಿ ವಶೇಹಿ ಯಸ್ಯಂದ್ರಿಯಾಣಿ ತಸ್ಯ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಾ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ತಸ್ಯ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಾ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ಸೊ ದಿ ವನ್ ಹೂ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಹೂ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಾನ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ವೈ ಆರ್ ಯು ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ವೈ ಸಿಂಪಲ್ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಹೈ ಥಿಂಕಿಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯುಕ್ತ ಆಸೀತ ಮತ್ಪರ ಕಾನ್ಸೆಂಟ್ರೇಟೆಡ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಮೀ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ದಿ ಅಲ್ಟಿಮೇಟ್ ರಿಯಾಲ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟಿ ಮೀ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಕಾನ್ಸೆಂಟ್ರೇಟೆಡ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಅ ಡೆವೋಟಿ ಯು ಆರ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಇಷ್ಟ ದೇವತ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಅ ಜ್ಞಾನಿ ಯು ಆರ್ ಟ್ರೈಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ದಿ ರಿಯಲ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ನಾಟ್ ದಿ ಬಾಡಿ ನಾಟ್ ದಿ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಯು ನೋ ಚಿದಾನಂದ ರೂಪ ಹರ್ಷಿಬೋಹಂ ಆಫ್ ದ ನೇಚರ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬ್ಲೆಸ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಬಾಡಿ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಯು ಟ್ರೈಂಗ್ ಟು ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಅ ಮಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಅ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಸೀಕಿಂಗ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಟ್ರೈಸ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಶೇಹಿ ಯಸ್ಯೇಂದ್ರಿಯಾಣಿ ತಸ್ಯ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಾ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ದಿ ರಿಯಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಯುವರ್ ವಿಸ್ಡಮ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಸ್ಟೇಬಲ್ ವೆನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆನ್ಸರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಸೊ ಪರ್ಸನ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ಸೆನ್ಸರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ತಸ್ಯ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಾ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ಇ ಮೇಕ್ಸ್ ಎ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಇಕ್ವೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟೂ ಥ್ರೂ ಔಟ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಎಗೈನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಸೊ ವಾಟ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಕಂಡೀಷನ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಹೌ ಮೆನಿ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕೋರ್ಸಸ್ ಡೂ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಅಟೈನ್ ಹೌ ಮೆನಿ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ಡೂ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಬೈ ಹೌ ಮೆನಿ ಆಫ್ ದಮ್ ಡೂ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ರೀಡ್ ಸೊ ಹಿ ಡಸನ್ ಸೇ ಎನಿ ಆಫ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ವಶೇಹಿ ಯಸ್ಯಂದ್ರಿಯಾಣಿ ಒನ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಆರ್ ಹರ್ ಸೆನ್ಸರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಸೊ ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಟು ದ ಸೆನ್ಸರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ನೋಟಿಸ್ ಒನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಸರ್ವಾಣಿ ತಾಣಿ ಸರ್ವಾಣಿ ದಿ ಸೆನ್ಸರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಇನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಎಂಟೈರಿಟಿ ನಾಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಆರ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೇವ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಫಾರ್ಮರ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಇಮ್ಯಾಜಿನ್ ಇನ್ ರೂರಲ್ ಬೆಂಗಾಲ್ ದ ರೈಸ್ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ದ ಕ್ರಾಪ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಅಂಡರ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸಮ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೊ ದಿ ಫಾರ್ಮರ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಹಾರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಅ ಚಾನಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ವಾಟರ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಕೆನಾಲ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಹಿಸ್ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಹಾರ್ಡ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅವರ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಕೇಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ದ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ಹಿ ಫೌಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ವಾಟರ್ ಹೆಡ್ ಡ್ರೈನ್ ಅವೆ ವೈ ಆನ್ ಆನ್ ದಿ ಬಾರ್ಡರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫೀಲ್ಡ್ ದೇ ವಾಸ್ ಅ ಹೋಲ್ ಸೊ ಥ್ರೂ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ವಾಟರ್ ಡ್ರೈನ್ ಅವೆ ವಿಚ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಸೋ ಹಾರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ದೇರ್ ಸೊ ಈವನ್ ಒನ್ ಹೋಲ್ ದಟ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಅಬ್ಸೆಷನ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ ಐ ಕೀಪ್ ಅ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಸೈಡ್ ಇಲ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಅ ಕ್ರೀಪರ್ ಇಲ್ ಕಮ್ ಅಪ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕವರ್ ಯುವರ್ ಎಂಟೈರ್ ಸೈಕಿ ಸೊ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ಎಫರ್ಟ್ ಗೋಸ್ ಟು ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಥ್ರೀ ಡ್ರಂಕರ್ಸ್ ಥ್ರೀ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ಅಟ್ ಡ್ರಂಕರ್ಸ್ ಹು ಗಾಟ್ ಆನ್ ಅನ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ನೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆವೆಲ್ರಿ ದೇ ಗಾಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಬೋಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೇ ವಾಂಟೆಡ್ ಟು ರೋ ಅಕ್ರಾಸ್ ದ ರಿವರ್ ಟು ದೇರ್ ಹೋಮ್ ಟೌನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೇ ರೋಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರೋಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರೋಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ದೇರ್ ರೈಟ್ ಆನ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ವೈ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಫರ್ಗಾಟನ್ ಟು ಅಂಟೈ ದಿ ಆಂಕರ್ ದಟ್ ದ ರೋಪ್ ವಿಚ್ ಟೈಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಟು ದ ಶೋರ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಫರ್ಗಾಟನ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ದಟ್ ರೋಪ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಟೈಡ್ ಟು ಸೆನ್ಸರಿ ಅಬ್ಸೆಷನ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಮಸ್
ಬುದ್ಧಿನಾಶಾತ್ಪ್ರಣಶ್ಯತಿ ಬುದ್ಧಿನಾಶಾತ್ಪ್ರಣಶ್ಯತಿ ಥಿಂಕಿಂಗ್ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ಲಿ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಡೆವಲಪ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ದ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಅಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಫ್ಲಾಶ್ ಇಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಗರ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಗರ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಇನ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ದ ಮೆಮರಿ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ವೆನ್ ದಟ್ ಮೆಮರಿ ಇಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ದಟ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ದ ಇಂಟೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂ ಇಂಟೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ ಎನಿ ಮೋರ್ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ನಾಶ ವೆನ್ ದ ಇಂಟೆಲೆಕ್ಟ್ ಕೆನಾಟ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ ಎನಿ ಮೋರ್ ಪ್ರಣಶ್ಯತಿ ವಿ ಫಾಲ್ ಅವೇ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ನೋಟಿಸ್ ದಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಏಟ್ ಲಿಂಕ್ಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಒನ್ ಥಿಂಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಟೂ ರಿಹಾಯತ್ವ ವಿಷಯ ಅನುಪಂಕ್ಷ ಸಂಘ ಅಂಡ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಸಂಘಸ್ಥೇಶು ಉಪಜಾಯತೆ ಸಂಘಾತ್ ಸಂಜಾಯತೆ ಕಾಮ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಅರೈಸಸ್ ದೆನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅರೈಸಸ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಐ ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಇಟ್ ದೆನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ವೆನ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಕಾಮಾತ್ ಕ್ರೋಧೋ ಅಪಿ ಜಾಯತೆ ಆ್ಯಂಗರ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಫೋರ್ ವೇ ವಾಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಗರ್ ಲೀಡ್ಸ್ ಟು ಕ್ರೋಧಾತ್ ಭವತಿ ಸಮ್ಮೋಹ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂಸರಿ ಎಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಸಮ್ಮೋಹ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸಮ್ಮೋಹಾತ್ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ವಿಭ್ರಮ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೆಮರಿ ಮೆಮರಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಲಿಟ್ರಲಿ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ದ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಹಬ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಅವರ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ರೆಸೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಬಿಕಮ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಯರ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಇಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋ ಆನ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಗೋಸ್ ಅವೇ ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವಿಂಡೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ನಂಬರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ a spriti bhangshat buddhi nasha so our intellect the decision making capacity fails and we make the wrong decisions what to say what to do and that leads to pranashyati you fall away from spiritual life eight one of our swami is one of my teachers swami atma priyanand ji who was here uh, last year i think yes so he jokingly said the like the buddha's eight eightfold way you know ashtanga marga like the ashtanga yoga the eightfold yoga of patanjali these are the eight this is the eightfold way to destruction <laughs> the eight steps to spiritual fall so those are the eight steps to nirvana or the eight steps to enlightenment it is eight steps to fall away <laughs> so what are these eight steps dhyayato vishayan punksha it starts with what what the mind dwells upon where the mind is kept what do you mean where the mind is kept is the mind like a box or a glass where you keep it somewhere or, you know no what is kept in the mind what am i thinking about in general my habitual thought patterns what am i dwelling upon dhyayato vishayan if if it's the sense objects things we see hear smell taste touch and it's inevitable you can either think of god or you can think of the world when sadhu said he was um, 104 years old <laughs> he said paramatma ka dhyan ya samsar ka chinta these are the only two alternatives let go of of the thought of god it need not be god in the theistic sense you are a spiritual practitioner you are a mi- you are practicing mindfulness in the buddhistic sense whatever your spiritual practice is let go of that the mind will go to samsara there is no other alternative until enlightenment what happens in enlightenment is when you realize that there is only one reality whatever you think about it will be that reality you know it know that it is that but until that point there are two for us there is something which we call god our real self yeah. and there is something and the rest without that it's all god uh, it's all samsara so the mind will if, you, if the mind drops away if, if it slips away from ishwara chinta the thought of god it will have samsara chinta one or the other similarly not just thinking love where is your heart it can either be given to god or mammon you cannot be a servant of both together the new testament the bible you can't you can't do both together why not no one will drive out the other you remember the hefty fellows they'll throw out the other so they are inimical they are up they, they are adverse and reverse of the thing you can't you can't do, you can't take both at the same time you have to take this side or that side 
Um, so dhyayato vishayan, if we dwell too long, too much on material things. One sadhu said many years ago, he was a traditional wandering monk, said, um, in each human being there are three streams which flow continuously. Teen dharae hai Mahatma ji. Three streams. What are the three streams? Jnana dhara, the stream of knowledge. Karma dhara, the stream of action, what you do. Bhava dhara. This is difficult to translate into English. Bhava means our inner orientation, what we really truly want inside. What we really want inside. Our orientation, our intentions, real intentions inside. Honestly, without telling anybody, honestly, what do I like? Do I really like spiritual life or is it just I think it's good for me? Do I really like working out in the gym? I think it's good for me, that's why I'm doing it. You know this famous uh, entrepreneur Elon Musk, he said something very interesting. This huge industry is there, you know, motivation, how to get motivated, it's a big thing in America or in the corporate world across the world. And this person who is like an epitome of uh, corporate life, he said, if you need to get motivated to do it, don't do it. <laughs> now don't take him literally. We get, need to get motivated to do so many good things in life and we should try to get motivated. But he has a, there's a deep truth which he points out. If you need to get motivated, it is not, this is what they're calling bhava. It's not your bhava, inner bhava. You really, really don't like it so far. You really, really don't want it. That's why I need to get motivated. I need to read these books. I need to take that seminar. I want to go to that workshop and buy all those self-help books from Barnes and Nobles. Not working. Why not? See, why they don't work? All those books work on what is called Jnana Dhara, the stream of knowledge. They will give you a lot of information. And quite a good, good bit of it is correct. It's not wrong at all. It doesn't touch the inner bhava. One guy said, I love playing video games. He doesn't have to be motivated to play video games. No. You have to be motivated not to play video games. So then the question arises, but that's the problem. There are things which I know are good for me, but I don't want to do that. There are things I know which are bad for me, but I can't stop myself from doing that. So the motivation is there, but it's in the wrong place. It's for things which are, I know they're damaging for me. I know they're no good for me. But I can't get, I, 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 that is, comes naturally. Bhava is there. That's the problem. The uh, lament of Duryodhana. When Krishna goes to Duryodhana, somebody said, why didn't Krishna tell all these nice things to the villain? He told it to all these things he said to the hero. The good guy. And if he had told all these things to the villain, the Duryodhana, it might have prevented a terrible war. But you know, he actually tried. Krishna, to his credit, he tried. And it was of no use. No use. Duryodhana wouldn't have come to the Vedanta class. <coughs> Why not? When Krishna tried to tell him these things, you know what was the reaction? Krishna tried to tell him that this, what you're doing is wrong. This is not dharma. This is adharma. And uh, Duryodhana said, Janami dharmam. I don't tell me what is right and wrong. Because I know what is right and wrong. That's not my problem. My problem is, what is right, I don't feel like doing it. And what is wrong, I can't stop myself from doing it. Why not? Why ever not? If you know it's wrong, why don't you stop yourself? If you know it's right, why don't you do it? Because, he says, there is a force within me. The way it drives me, I, I, I move in that way. I can't help it. Honest. Honest. That is a deep human problem. And I'll tell you what's wrong with Duryodhana's analysis. I'll tell you next. But first notice the honesty of the person. It's, it's everybody's problem. If it were not, we would all be sthita pragya, established in the in divine. It would, would, wouldn't take, much, take us much, uh, much time at all. A few weeks, few months. The worst case would take one year or so. <laughs> We'll all become enlightened. Janami dharmam nachame pravritti. I know the dharma, but I have no pravritti. No, I don't feel like doing it. 
that impulse is not there. It's, I'm not inspired to do it. Janami adharmam nachame name nivritti. I have. I know what is adharma, what is bad and immoral, and I know I, what I'm doing is taking me down a terrible path. But I can't stop myself from doing it. By some force within. What is that force within? <coughs> some scars. Freud discovered it. <laughs> In the early part of 20th century. And this city was the, the hotbed of, uh, of Freudian psychoanalysis. Some scars. Condi- subconscious con- conditioning. That, that really controls us. We think we are rational uh, and our res- rationality controls our behavior. And no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Most of our thought, our feelings, our emotions, our decisions and behavior are controlled by irrational forces. Just with a little cream froth of rationality on top. You have a question? Uh, hold on to the question. I'll come to you. I mentioned this earlier, the three great humiliations of humanity. Have I mentioned this earlier? Freud, it seems he said, humanity has been, in, uh, has been humiliated thrice. First, when Copernicus said, we are not the center of the universe. <laughs> At that time, the sun is the center of the universe and we are little like a little world whirling around. The, the Copernican revolution, we are not the center of the universe. We are, and now we know more and more as in 20th century and now 21st century, we know how tiny and insignificant we are in a vast and uncaring cosmos. First great humiliation. But we felt, okay, but we are not um, um, center of the universe, but at least we are made in the image of God. Man is made in the image of God. And woman from the rib of man. So. <laughs> but at least we are divine, divine origination. And then Darwin comes along. Not image of God, you're made in the image of a chimp. <laughs> Evolution proves that. The second great humiliation. Freud is saying this. Sigmund Freud. The second great humiliation of humanity. That you're not descended from God. If You are evolved from monkeys. Then the third, Freud said, then I dealt the third great blow to human pride. We thought, all right, we are animals, but we are rational animals. The definition of human beings, rational animal. Time from the time of the Greeks, rational animal. We are guided by logic and reason. Seems to be reasonable. Freud said, no. That logic and reason is only the surface. Underneath there is a seething mass of, of instinctive drives. Lust and anger and envy and jealousy. And or the primal urges. Which the frail ego is trying to balance. Uh, the super ego, what the society says, you should be like this. And the id from within, which says, I want this, I want that, I, want, I hate that, I want to kill that guy. In between is, this, is a tiny fragile layer of the ego. Uh, the Freudian structure, the triadic structure, super ego, underneath the id, and in between the balancing act done by the ego, what we feel ourselves to be conscious ego. Trying to balance the demands of society for, for, for being moral with the primal urges bubbling up from within. And our decisions, our so-called logic is heavily influenced by these irrational drives. You're not a rational animal, just an animal, Freud said. <laughs> that is what the yogis knew thousands of years ago. Kenapi Devan, this is this power within us which is driving me along and I can't resist it. So don't talk to me about what is right and wrong. So what is wrong in this, this approach? What's wrong is this? If this is true, then what's the point of any, any attempt at changing? What is the point of any spiritual life, any meditation, or even, even a self-help seminar? Uh, Tony, Tony Robbins? What's the point? You can't change if you cannot change. But you can change. That's the great thing. People do change. And we have the possibility of changing. We know that we have the possibility of changing. And we do want to change. But there is, we need a way, a training, a methodology, a path. 
and those are the yogas our point is not fixed that i i love um video games and i should be studying i don't love studying and this is my di- dilemma but you're not fixed there forever you can actually educate the mind and the heart and the senses this is what all yoga is all about so that it is transformed our urges are transformed and ultimately we come to a point where like you loved video games you actually love your studies you might think that's a tall order it's not aren't there many many people who do love their studies i often say some students used to come and say to me that this subject is so boring remember it's boring to me it's not the fault of the subject it's the fault of my mind aren't there people who love that subject they really love that subject I mean, the complaint usually used to be about Sanskrit grammar. It's boring, but it's boring to you. But it's not boring to the Sanskrit pundit who loves it more than anything else. So the subject is intrinsically interesting. Every subject is; otherwise, it couldn't have developed. The people who have given their whole lives to it. Darwin, I was reading. People get bored with all the taxonomy and the uh, of uh, you know classification of species and all of that. Darwin was crazy about it. He loved it. as a child. I mean, how can you deny samskaras? This is a stunning story of Darwin going out into the little woods near his house in England and collecting beetles. There are different kinds of beetles. And he had a whole collection as a child. He must have done things like that in his past life. Otherwise, why as a child would you children collect it? But that craze is there. and there's a story of how the little kid he's caught one beetle in one hand another beetle in another hand and this third rare beetle crawling along a leaf if he if he goes back to his house and puts those beetles in the little bottles and comes back for this one it would have flown away what does he do he quickly puts one beetle in his mouth <laughs> catches hold of the other and then races back to his room to put all three in the three, three different bottles and classify them now what do you mean about what do you say the biology is boring here is this little kid who is more crazy about collecting and classifying beetles than you are about playing your video game so it's not a problem with the subject it's the conditioning of the mind and therefore we can change so ami vivekananda said to develop the powers of attachment and detachment perfectly it can be done i have heard the story about um so there was one swami swami nirvedananda one of the pioneers in the ramakrishna order uh, in in the field of education in the 1920s 30s and those who are from calcutta you know the belgoria students home those who have uh, you know so it's the first one of the first educational institutes of the ramakrishna order he founded it now the story goes that it was 1939 and the second world war had started and in those and so the swami was fascinated in the those the radio the bbc news would be there from the radio he would listen to it and he would have this map in front of him a map of europe and with a pencil he would trace where the german armies are advancing where the allied armies are advancing and somebody said swami how do you meditate you're spending all your time on on this and swami looked very surprised and he said to that person but i don't think about the war when i'm meditating and i don't think about meditation when i'm thinking about the war is <laughs> big truth there it's not so easy to do he could do it probably but it's not so easy to do. but there's a big truth there when we are doing this playing video games i should be studying i should be studying and st- studying i wish i could play a little more video games we can't control our attachments and detachments so i'm vivekananda used to say empty the bucket empty the bucket i read about napoleon he said it seems he could do many things at the same time he could dictate to seven secretaries some he's dictating uh, 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 orders for the war another for construction of bridges in paris another to a letter to the, uh, the empress josephine to his wife and so on seven secretaries they're all busy writing he's dictating across seven how is that possible the tremendous control over the mental faculties and he i think he, he's the one who wrote that there the, i've got cabinets in my mind and so right he, he's the one who said i open when i want to know the finances i open that cabinet i shut the others 
When I want to know the, the war situation, I open that one and shut the others. And when I want to sleep, I shut all the... He had the capacity to go to sleep at any time. Many will say, I also have that capacity. <laughs> <laughs> if you have, you are blessed. <laughs> but he said, when I... But at will, when I, when I shut all the cabinets in the mind, I fall asleep. He could, it seems he could sleep on his war horse. <laughs> so... Yes, what was the question? <coughs> Swamiji, talking about dharma and adharma, yes. the question is regarding karna. Yes. So karna was supposed to be somebody who really upheld dharma all the time. Hmm. But when it came to the disrobing of Draupadi, hmm. at that time, even he put his head down, he did not oppose the Kauravas. Hmm. So how do you explain that? Here is somebody who is considered one of the epitomes, I mean, after Yudhishthir, hmm. he was considered a person upholding dharma. So. Yes and no. When Karma, Karna finally died in the mythology, you'll see, when, when he finally was killed, and uh, he said, this is unfair. My chariot is stuck in the mud, and you're going to um, kill me now. I think it is Krishna who gives a long... Uh, explanation or, or he points out where all kar- Karna had uh, done wrong things. See, you mentioned one. Clearly there is something wrong going on and I am in a situation where I can oppose it and say something. When I do not do so, it's a failure of courage. There's a lack of uprightness there. So Karna is a Tragic figure, no doubt. And many people identify and sympathize, if not identify, sympathize with him. True, the figure is drawn in that way. But there are fatal flaws in that figure also. Mm. So the, is that also because of samskara? Samskaras, yes. Here is one thing to remember. These two words, please remember. Swarupa and Swabhava. Very important to remember. Swarupa and Swabhava. Literally, in, in, uh, if you translate, Swarupa means our real nature. What is our real nature? Atman. Existence, consciousness, bliss. Or in a theistic sense, nothing other than the divine within us. That is Swarupa. Whose nature? Mine and yours and, and Sri Ramakrishna's and Krishna's and Arjuna's. All of them. We have all have the same Swarupa. At least according to Advaita Vedanta, we are all one with God. Our nature is, is Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. That's Swarupa. Our real nature. That's what we are trying to understand. And we, right now we feel I am this body-mind. This body, mind, sensory complex. But we are not this. But there is another very important word to learn. Swabhava. How will I translate that? Again that word bhava is there. Dispositions. The set of this. Our character basically. This swabhava is not our real self. But it is the way our mind has been conditioned over lifetimes. That's what makes us different. That's what makes us different. In Swarupa, real nature, we are all one. We are all divine. Right now. And we always were. But the good and the bad, Swabhava. The greedy and the self-controlled, Swabhava. Where does this Swabhava come from? You see, where does the Swarupa come from? It's original. It's, it's not created. Swabhava, it comes from, it's called Prachina kar- Karma Samskara. The accumulated karma, the conditioning of many lives, that is Swabhava. So what we come with into our lives. Swami Vivekananda says that, like the poet, I think Wordsworth said, we come trailing clouds of glory into this life. And Swamiji said, some of us come trailing black, <laughs> black smoke. But it's a mixture. Our Swabhava is a mixture of many lifetimes. So what we are struggling with right now, I love to play video games, I don't love to study Swabhava, not Swarupa. So what we are struggling against, what we are trying to polish, what we are trying to change and motivate, that is Swabhava. The tendencies within, and they are all in the mind. Remember, essentially we are one with God, pure and perfect, always. So nobody deep within is a sinner. So is the doctrine of the sinner, is it wrong? It's not wrong. It's the conditioning in the mind. So the, unfortunately what is manifested in life and in actions is the swabhava. So we need to, Swami so Vivekananda said, you need to polish the mirror. You need to polish the mirror. Just hold the question. 
I'll, I'll, let me hold the question. Let me just finish this part. So Swabhav and Swarupa, remember this. What is the difference between Arjuna and Duryodhana? Swabhav and Swarupa. Swarupa is same for Arjuna and Duryodhana and Krishna. All of them are the same Swarupa. They are all one with God. But Swabhava Arjuna is the hero and Swabhava Duryodhana is the villain. This Swabhava, the hope is, it is subject to change. It is changing slowly. If we consciously try to change it, it will change. We can change it. All these spiritual practices are consciously trying to change the Swabhava. So when Elon Musk says, don't do anything if it be required to be motivated, what he really means is not that you give up all your high aspirations. You just recognize the power which is working within. I require to be motivated because right now my Swabhava is not oriented towards the things which I want. I need to orient it. And I can do it. That's why these warnings are there. That uh, be careful about the Swabhava. You have these high goals. But the sensory system and the mind, they'll sweep you away. Because their, their swabhava is, is, the conditioning is like that. It can be changed over time. Yes. Swamiji, would you consider Bhishma Pitamaha to be an enlightened soul? I think so, yes. And if so, why did you fight on the side of the Kalaras? Uh, difficult to say. <laughs> <laughs> One word, life. Difficult to say. There's no doubt he was a great person. There's no doubt. He took a decision because he thought he was being moral, right? He had given his word to protect the lineage of the Kauravas. So the beauty and the ter terrible thing about the Mahabharata is that it shows that what is very neat in Vedanta, in textbooks, when it meets life, it becomes much more complicated. And yeah, gets very messy. And uh, that's what we see not only in the Mahabharata, in each of our individual lives. That's the very nature of life. So the Mahabharata, that's why uh, it's, uh, ethic, the ethical questions in Mahabharata are very sophisticated, very deep and sophisticated. We'll just leave it at that. Dhyayato vishayan pungsa. So when you, th when, you, when you dwell too much on sense objects, what happens? An attachment develops, a raga, an attachment develops. It is nice. It's nice. Uh, worth having. Then from that attachment, at this stage, remember, we think that, yeah, I'm thinking about it, I cannot think about it. But very soon you see that it, it's very difficult not to think about those things. It becomes a habit. Uh, it could be di it's different from different people, what, what our uh, personal predilections are like. Then, Sangat Sanjayate Kama. From this comes desire. There it becomes powerful. What is the nature of desire? I want this, this gadget, uh, this person, this job, this um, place, uh, that experience, that enjoyment, that parking spot. So I want. This is the nature of karma, I want. And immediately, kamat krodha vijayate. From desire comes anger. Um, desire comes, anger means parking spot, best example. You are, that's a nice parking spot. I want it. And then the, suddenly the guy in front, red light slowly backing into that spot. <laughs> and you become angry. <laughs> desire thwarted. Desire thwarted leads to anger. Desire leads to, karma leads to two things. Karma leads to two things. We can check in our lives. Leads to two things. When it is satisfied, when we indulge in it, lobhaha, greed. I want more. Variety. Again, again. Because it gives pleasure. And I want it again and again. Lobha. When it's thwarted. Thwarted when? I know it's possible for me to get it. And now this person, this circumstance is coming in my way. Anger. Flash of anger comes. It's the same desire which is converted into anger. Kama and Krodha, they go together. Krishna says in the Gita, Kama Esha Krodha Esha Rajoguna Samudbhava Mahashana Mahapapma. This anger and desire, they are born of Rajoguna Rajas. And, remem and remember, O Arjuna, these are voracious, they are hungry. They're like hungry ghosts. And Mahapapma, they are productive of great sin. Watch these. Keep them, uh, be alert about these two. So, Kama leads to Krodha. 
always at the root of any kind of flash of anger, there is some kind of desire. It could be good. Well, we say righteous indignation. All right, righteous indignation. You know that something wrong is happening. But even there, there is desire. Such a thing should happen. It is not happening. And these people are bad. I am good. Hence, flash of anger on them. They deserve my anger. Usually when we are angry on people, it, it's often that I am right. They are wrong. Even hatred. It's okay to hate them because they are the hateful people. <laughs> so they are the ones who are hating. So I, I, it's okay to hate people who hate others. No. Anger. There is anger there. You know the famous uh, Buddhist teacher, the one who popularized mindfulness all over the West, um, Thich Nhat Hanh. I read a news article that he's dying now. He's back in Vietnam in his monastery. He's uh, uh, about to pass away. He's passed away? No, he's about to pass. So uh, he, when he first came to Europe in the 70s, at that time these anti-war movement, the Greenpeace movement was in Germany. It was going on demonstrations against nuclear weapons and so, so peace for peace. And he writes, he's observing it as a Vietnamese monk coming to the West for the first time. He says, I was surprised at how angry these peace protesters were. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't see the contradiction. But they felt, they felt, this is bad and it's good to be angry about something bad. True, but still there's a contradiction there. Kamat Krodha Vijayate. Notice, Mahatma Gandhi uh, or Martin Luther King, here, they, uh, they fought the good fight against injustice, against evil, but they never hated the people they were fighting against. Nowhere ever you'll see Mahatma Gandhi hated the British. He did, never did. Some of his closest friends were British. There is no hatred there. It, and without hatred also you can f uh, fight against injustice. And that's, the, that's where it really becomes powerful. I'm doing something wrong. You're not angry with me. You just want good for me and for others. And I will sense it in you. When, when you counsel me, even scold me. We have a saying, who can scold? Who can punish? The one who loves. Not the one who says, I am more virtuous than you, you are bad, I will punish you. Then the person who is being punished, has, there is a reaction in the mind of that person. Kamat krodho vijayate. Then what happens from, from anger? Krodhat bhavati sammoha. Delusion comes. Confusion comes. What to do and what not to do. It's not only from anger actually. From desire, four things come. As Swami Ram Sukhdas just pointed this out. From desire, four things come. Lobha, greed. Greed also leads to some moha, delusion. What is dharma and what is adharma? I overstep. Because I want, I want, I want. What is my diet prescription? <laughs> my resolution, this is my going to be my diet. I overstep and open the fridge and raid the fridge and eat it. I'm saying something which is Seems to be a common problem in, in the West now. So, but that's the classic example of greed overcoming uh, my resolutions. So greed leads to some moha. Lobha leads to some moha. Krodha, anger. Anger leads to delusion also, of course. That flash of anger, then what I should not say, I say. Often, harsh words are the most difficult things to forgive. People remember them for a long time. Even after the quarrel is over, your harsh words are remembered. You might have forgotten what the quarrel was about. But because of the quarrel, you said harsh words to each other. Those harsh words were, remain in the memory for decades and decades. For decades together, for, la for a lifetime. And it hurts. So, anger. Uh, that also leads to delusion. Then, um, th th then uh, there is... Uh, um, Lobha, Krodha, uh, then there is one more. Um, 
mo no so this is some more some more the delusion comes out of all of these uh, mamata identification mamata means mine my child my friend my political party my b- football or basketball basketball team once it's mine partiality comes my religion my countryman partiality comes so our our um, our balance is disturbed because of that then some more so delusion from delusion some more hot smriti vibhrama all the things that we had learned all the classes and seminars and the books we have read and the verses memorized they go out of the out of the window at that moment and we react we react from what not from what we have learned all this wisdom but from instinctive reactions default setting the reaction comes from there smriti vibhrama loss of memory here means not that you become an amnesiac but loss of learning smritir bhangshat buddhi nash buddhi means viveka here what is to be done what is not to be done what is right and what is wrong i have decided the, the goal of life is god realization and this is the behavior that is consistent with god realization all of that decision becomes uh, um it just goes out of the window and i react in anger uh, or in hatred so buddhi nash buddhi nashat pranashyati and when the decision is wrong then falling away from spiritual life becomes uh, inevitable one more thing is it takes a long time to to describe this sequence of eight steps but it happens in a flash that's that's what one should remember it happens in a flash it doesn't matter but um, uh, what what matters is over time as we are spiritual practitioners this should become less and less less frequent less intense and we should be able to come out of it faster that's the sign of progress so yes um my question is about martin luther king you were talking about and the importance of the material world you said that so we were talking about injustice yes and here in the united states we talk a lot about inequality material especially material inequality and we see how it when you do when you have people living in poverty it creates a lot of suffering so i was wondering to what degree do you have to accord some importance to basic material comfort or some it seems like you have to accord some importance to material true so that you don't have people living in you know. true if you ignore the material world completely that can be disastrous too but notice one thing all of these people like mahatma gandhi or martin luther king you will see they confirm to this kind of uh, austere controlled life it's only when i'm controlled in my own life and i minimize my materiality then i can struggle for the wider causes of justice for others when my own sensory system is uh, running amok when i have no control over my mind then i am a slave to this particular body mind system so my concern with material things will be for material things for i me and mine that's the problem with most people what what is the difference between one martin luther king and mahatma gandhi and the rest of us the most most people are so concerned and caught up with this one single body mind system this one so all the effort goes towards satisfying this thing the less we are slaves to this body mind system the more we can think about the welfare of others notice here arjuna is literally fighting a battle on the side of righteousness against uh, what is wrong and after learning all this he still goes and he's supposed to go and fight that battle that's what krishna is trying to persuade him to do he's not telling him to give up all concern with the battle itself arjuna wanted to stop and krishna said no you can do your duty much better and work for the welfare of others much better when one's own senses are under control own mind is under control even emotions are under check so i'm vivekananda said the, the sentimental and the emotional waste most of their energy in feeling 
it's the calm level headed person who can work work and do great work but which kind of calm and level headed person there are a lot of calm and level headed persons and they are doing great work for themselves it's the calm and level headed person who has this control over the senses who has the mastery over desires the mind and the sensory system who can really do work for others notice that the truly spiritual people whom we consider to be spiritual or whom you would consider to be spiritual you will notice that they are also strongly altruistic they're deeply altruistic that uh, they always put others before their own own needs yeah. does that answer your question yeah it's not really a concern for material things it's rather a concern for the welfare of others right it's not really a concern about cars or food or houses it's so that the others get those cars and food and houses and uh, education it's actually a concern for human beings it's a spiritual concern sri ramakrishna also said he said you can't have really a spirituality on an empty stomach in bengali khali pete dharma hai na which is true which is true sometimes the one may be misled into thinking the, the yogi the skinny yogi sitting in his cave in the himalayas so that is the ideal and so all of this is not necessary society and schools and hospitals no 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 absolutely not vedanta is not against this world vedanta shows us a much wiser way a more spiritual way of living in this world itself and when the time is uh, uh, come to go we can go absolutely freely and happily without any clinging or any any worry yeah does that answer yeah yes Yes. Um you might be thinking you're doing that but uh, you could possibly be repressing you want to know the difference. True. That. Yes, you have to be careful because repression always has um a side effect. You really cannot repress anything. It will come out in its in, in some other way. So this uh, control of the senses is for directing these energies towards a higher goal. Uh in this case it's spirituality. it could be art it could be science notice there i think <laughs> elon musk has a point if you need to be motivated then don't do it a, a scientist who is passionate about his research an artist who is passionate about music or or painting or something most of the other things sort of sort of fall away automatically otherwise the person cannot achieve anything in life yeah. if you're dedicating 8 10 12 hours a day to something in your life the rest of the things automatically have to follow away that is dispassion that is that is vairagya but there you already have the motivation there is most of us don't have that kind of motivation for something that that should not dishearten us we can move this point from loving video games to loving studies and that can be done but um wisely carefully wisely but consistently also and it can be done others have done it and so can i right true i'll give you it is true it is true that, oh yes it is true uh, i'll give you just one um but there is a very big subject but very interesting subject just one thing i'll i'll tell you um one is are you happy if you suppress it consistently over a long period of time you'll notice something you are achieving your goals of controlling the senses but you'll notice you're consistently unhappy I knew this monk who who was who seemed very depressed a very good monk young young monk seemed very depressed um so uh, he, I said see what is there to be depressed about uh, it's, it's only when i have a desire and i'm not getting satisfied my desire is not being satisfied then only i feel unhappy and you know what he told me he said quite honestly this is the see i don't have any desires what is what is wrong there repressed he says that they said raso varjam the trace is left if you look at it on paper it's perfectly all right but deep inside the subconscious mind the trace for worldly uh, pleasures is left and the result is because it's repressed you won't see anything on the surface in life is perfectly all right but because it's repressed there's only one sign of that depression unhappiness it has to be worked at now i'll give you just one way of doing it um control of the senses 
does not always mean you have to go around with a sour face and look, look stressed out. What are you doing controlling the senses? <laughs> there is, uh, I'll give you uh, this, uh, look it up. There is uh, a psychologist, Tal Ben Shar. Um, his, I forgot the name of the book. S H A H A R, Shar. Tal Ben Shar. Happiness. The name of the book is Happiness. Now, he is uh, a professor of psychology in Harvard University. Or you can just Google it, the most popular course in Harvard. It's, uh, it's supposed to be the most popular course at least a few years back uh, in Harvard University, where they a classroom, they had to shift out and uh, hire a theater, a theater for classes. Hundreds of Harvard University students, undergrads, took this course. One, they had, his book is full of these very interesting insights. One insight is this. He gives the example of food. So there is eating healthy, that's the goal. Eating healthy is the goal. Now there is food which is tasteless and unhealthy. There's food which is very tasty but unhealthy. There's food which is very healthy but tasteless. And there's a saying that if it's good, if it tastes good, it must be bad for you. <laughs> so it's, uh, many people think healthy food must taste bad. So uh, tasteless but very healthy. And the last one is tasty and healthy. And he says what is true of this food, if you try to, um, if you indulge in the tasty, taste, uh, in, uh, in tasty food and which is unhealthy, you'll ruin your health. If you try to hold on to these multiple diets and may be healthy, you can succeed if you have a lot of willpower, but you're likely to fail again and again. And you are, even if you succeed, you're likely to go around with a sour face. What are you doing? I'm eating healthy. <laughs> But he says a wise course is to do something, when you're practicing something, enjoy that practice. So eat food with his, which is healthy and tasty. And he says, dietitians know it, doctors know it, there, there are many such foods which you think it, you will not like it, but you start eating it, you'll like it. They're really tasty. And you can, there's something that you can hold on to, it's a diet you can hold on to. Now he says this is about food, but this is true of everything in life. So all the practices that we do, Keep a component of happiness involved there. It should not be a, a miserable thing. Our um, president of our order, Swami Smaranandji, he said something which really appealed to me. He says, the goal is bliss, the means too must be bliss. The means too must be blissful. When you are a sadhu, when you are a spiritual seeker, when you are a yogi, you should be happy. Not a forced smiley face. But genuinely happy, and we have seen that. The good monks are usually the ones who are happy. St. Teresa of Avila, she said, a sad nun is a bad nun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll end with this. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu